At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. When we talk about River City, which city are we talking about? Sacramento or West Sacramento? Increasingly, it's both. Our namesake cities are connected. Residents on both sides are sampling the charms of what the other has to offer. From an evening watching River Cats baseball to strolling Midtown, taking in the best of the region's nightlife. A new effort in connecting the cities is going back to the future through the introduction of streetcars to further connect the two cities. Joining us today to talk about what's next are West Sacramento Mayor Christopher Cabaldon and Sacramento City Councilman Steve Cohn. We used to have streetcars in this region and we got rid of them. Why are they back? Well, because they actually uh, really help people get around that last mile where they don't need a car. If light rail only fills a certain niche to get people a longer distance. But when you want to circulate people around the central city and into West Sacramento, streetcars you can get on, get off really easily. They're much more fun, in fact. So that's one of those things we need to bring back. Mayor Cabaldon, how would this work? Well, the, 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 a lot of the infrastructure in theory is already there. We, we, we did have streetcars for, for over a century. Uh, first drawn, pulled by mules, then by electricity. They covered both sides of the river. Um, and today, so it's just putting, putting that back in place. Uh, and so we know how to make that work. And it's happening in city after city after the country, uh, around the country. Like where? Um, you can almost not name a city where it isn't happening now. <laughs> um, I mean, Portland and Tampa are some of the are two examples. Seattle, L.A., even L.A. is going back to streetcars. San Francisco's had them for a while. Uh, virtually every city in the country already has them of any, uh, uh, or is uh, in the process of restoring their streetcar systems. Right. So it's just for us, it's a question of a three, three and a half mile uh, track and loop between the two communities. And we say it that way, but it's really not about the two places. It's about all the places that you'd want to go. Um, that you today you're walking or biking or driving or taking the bus, but really makes it for a quick connection, makes it easier to walk around uh, the central city and the best that the region has to offer into the core. Why wouldn't we just put more buses on the street rather than streetcars? What's magical about a streetcar? Well, it, it is more fun and people love to get, you can get on and off really easily, but the main thing is it is there permanently so people uh, will invest knowing that that line is going to be there, whereas a bus uh, uh, may or may not be there into the future. The other thing about rail in general, including streetcars, is it does have a higher capital investment, but your operating costs are actually much lower because uh, it, it takes less, uh, it, well, first of all, the cars last a lot longer. They last uh, 20 to 30 years. How much is this going to cost to put in this initial Line. Well, we're doing a cost study right now to refine that, but the range is in a, the range of 130 to 150 million. That includes not just the tracks and infrastructure, but also the cars. And then about, you know, roughly one and a half million a year to operate. Now, is this going to look exactly the same way as, say, San Francisco, where you've got all these lines running all over the place? Uh, no. Uh, so it, it, the issue around overhead lines, we're still figuring all of that out, the, how the cars get powered. Uh, as part of the, the work that's happening right now. But San Francisco uh, chose in a lot of ways to go with an old style streetcar system. A couple generations ago, and then even a couple generations ago, they wanted to look backwards. Our streetcar line, I think our intention is to look forward and to deploy uh, really the most prevalent and advanced technology to, to serve our, our community. In part for the reason that this you mentioned. I mean, buses, it's a great question because it's, it's, the, it's the most obvious one. Well, you know, a bus seems cheaper, you, it's flexible, but all of those things are bad, actually. So, you know, you talk really? about- you, you, like if you travel to another place, and I, I run into so many people in my own community are like, oh yeah, I went to DC and I love taking the metro, or I went to Paris, the metro was amazing, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I never hear, it because they never do, go on the buses in those places. Why is that? Well, part of the reason is the flexibility of the buses also make them totally unpredictable. 
for folks who don't use them every single day to, to commute. And so you're like, well, if I get on this bus, wait, okay, is this the 42B or the 42J? Because the 42J on Thursdays runs counterclockwise, but on Wednesdays it, it skips three stops. And if I get on this, where am I going to end up? With anything on rail, you know you get on, here's a little grid, you know where you're going to end up. It's not subject to the whims of the government. You know, that's amazing. Uh, this is the first time I've ever thought about I never, when I travel to other cities, I always ride public transportation, but I never ride the bus. It's yeah. always a, a, a subway yeah. or well, a light rail. The or other thing to uh, reemphasize Chris's point is when you uh, usually look at a rail system, whether it's light rail, subway, streetcar, usually they're integrated with different types of rail, which ours would be, by the way. The streetcar would not be just by itself. It'd be part of a larger system. You can fit all that on a map that's very easy to read and is color-coded. Buses, not, not, you know, there's little black squiggly lines go all over. So for, Chris is right, for a visitor, the streetcar is much more friendly. Right. It's, it's also a little bit of an insurance against people like me and Steve, if you're a bus rider. <laughs> you know, we're both on bus boards. Tell, tell me more about that. We're both on boards of directors for local bus systems, whether it's RT or YOLO bus. And, you know, every, every month at, the, at our board meetings, somebody from the public comes and says, you know, this new thing just opened up and the bus should stop there. Or we just, you just open up a new neighborhood, the bus should stop there. And so you're constantly adding stops, moving stops around based on, you know, public input. But if you're a rider, you're like, well, wait, the bu where's the bus going now? I thought the bus went here. And, 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 it, and it becomes so complex and so uncertain that even if you're just not a visitor, but just an occasional rider, say you ride the bus once a week or a couple times a month, that you just don't know where it's going to go. And, so, and that's because we're trying to be responsive in government, but once it's on the rail, it's a permanent commitment. Wow. Plus, can't you remember colors easier than numbers? <laughs> for, at least for simple folks like me, yes, that is true. Take us back to our past and uh, connect this effort today to where we started well, with uh, good, good question. Train and, and I tell you, we would love to get back to where we were, frankly, in the, uh, before World War II in terms of transit. We had in Sacramento. Of course, keep in mind, most of the population was much closer to the downtown area. But most people lived within walking distance of a streetcar line that could get them to downtown or where they needed to go. Uh, they also had the opportunity to take a train down to the Bay Area. They only took a, a, a less time than it does today, a, about an hour and 40 minutes. Um, that's because there weren't other alternatives, and that's in fact, it was such that people could actually make money off running streetcars. PG&E used to run right. streetcars. I, I, I actually heard something to the effect that McKinley Park and McClatchy Park were originally created as amusement parks by that, streetcar companies. That, that's right, they were, and, and, uh, and that carried on even when the amusement parks closed and they became more our, our first suburbs. They continued to be used really up until uh, World War II. Uh, it's not quite as bad as in L.A. where they tore up the, the famous rig cars, but we really turned our back on that. And, of course, our region took off growth-wise. We became dependent on cars. Now we're not trying to get rid of cars. Uh, cars are here to stay. What we need, though, are more choices for people. And people, you look at all the best cities that you would like to emulate, all have a really high-functioning transit system. What's the impact, if, if streetcars go in, what is the impact uh, on the existing tra mass transportation systems? The bus lines that service uh, both communities, the light rail system, mm -hmm. is there any sort of, of synergy between those functions? It's huge. So one of the issues for folks who are contemplating using tr public transit, whether it's bus or light rail, for example, to come into the urban core, you know, whether they're commuting from a Roseville or a Folsom or a Rancho Cordova or even other parts of, Sa of Sacramento, is that once they get into downtown for work um, or they get to West Sac for work, uh, you know, well, what if I have a meeting across, you know, across town? Or what if today I don't want to eat at the sandwich stop r uh, right next to my state agency, but I really want to go down to Midtown to eat? How am I going to get there? Well, okay, I have to take my car. 
And with the point of the streetcar is to make it possible to exist in the urban core without having the car. So you, may, you would take the light rail in, take the long distance bus, the express bus in from Davis, knowing that you can get around easily because the streetcar system is there. So in a lot of ways, the streetcar system activates the rest of the transportation system. That's where I want to go, system. which is I want to know how is it that West Sacramento is going to be different and how is Sacramento going to be different once the system's in place? Well, I, 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 part this notion of the, that there's a Sacramento and a West Sacramento, which is a government thing mostly, I think m more and more will start to erode. The streetcar will will uh, kind of uh, pull the curtain back on what the what our real lives are like. I mean, I actually I own a company that is headquartered in Sacramento, so I'm a business owner in Sacramento. I live in West Sacramento, um, but I spend you know eight hours a day at least in the city of Sacramento, and then I'll go in for a theater, for a, a restaurant sometimes. The notion that I'm just a West Sacramento guy, even though I'm the mayor in my community is crazy and that's true for most everybody we're all living the region we're living the place not just our jurisdictions and I think the streetcar really makes that possible and activates it in both places in the same way that the streetcars originally helped to make McKinley Park and ESAC and Midtown possible uh, and made them what they are today made them the kind of lively denser places that they are that's going to happen in both Sacramento and West Sacramento as a result the, the other thing is this is just the start we actually see potential to have streetcar systems in other parts of the region really? too that would interconnect with our larger light rail backbone and even the the inner city rail uh, uh, a, a senior official over at RT who had come here from Washington, she had been in another, uh, a couple of different places. She said to me when she first came here, she said, a region has the transportation system that it deserves based on the commitment of the public to finance it, but that there's a certain threshold that we have to get to within this region in terms of infrastructure in order to make the convenience so that people really do have an attractive alternative to the car. Other than this streetcar system, what else has to happen in order to really get people out of their cars so that we do function more like the, the types of cities that we, we want to emulate? Yeah, well, in my mind, it means a very comprehensive uh, infusion of, of resources, both in terms of light rail, for example. We want to expand light rail to the airport. We're in the process of expanding it down towards Elk Grove connecting all our colleges, connecting all the major employment centers. Think of light rail as kind of the backbone. You still need buses to cover uh, most of the territory. Our goal in the RT Transit vi uh, vision is to ensure that 80 to 90 percent of the entire population of our county and region could access reliable frequent service, which would mean at least 20 minute service. That way, if you miss one bus or train, you're, you're not worried, you're, you're stuck all day. You can make better, and it also enables better connections. In addition, we need better inner city service. We right now have one of the best in the, in the country with Sacramento, the Bay Area. But with uh, more investment there in the infrastructure, we could make that much better to where you could get from Sacramento, the Bay Area in one hour. And when, when do we think that this system at least the first uh, legs of it will be up and running. Well, under our most aggressive time frame, uh, we'd be we'd be up and running shortly after the opening of the downtown arena. Uh, so just within a couple of years, uh, that requires everything going our way. But so far, it is. You know, our voters a couple of years ago passed a special sales tax um, just for the streetcar. Um, they're like, we're all in. We want this to happen. And the uh, residents in Sacramento County have been big supporters of transit. So the, the, the DNA is there. The federal government said, yeah, we, we want to help make this happen too. So uh, we think we're on track to make that work quickly. We need to. But both, I mean, the arena is a good example of the sort of project that only really works if you have an effective transit system, both to bring people in, but also to move them around from restaurants and parking lots to the arena. But also, in addition to you know offering more service, we have to have different land use, right? We need to grow uh, in order to create the kind of places where you could choose not to have a car or only have one car in your family, um, or a, you know one of those electric cars that only goes 40 miles. Right. Um, <laughs> that you that you have you, that you can live most of your life nearby, and that requires a certain amount, a certain kind of land use. That kind of land use, our experiences can only happen with things like the streetcar. So the streetcar is key to make that possible, even if you don't ever take it. Incidentally, Councilman Cohn, I'm going to ask you the impolitic question, which is this. 
why are you helping this guy? Some would say <laughs> that putting this system in place is merely empowering West Sacramento to steal Sacramento's jobs yeah. and vice versa. Well, that's an unfortunate view that some people have that I think are stuck in the past. And I think if they look to the future, they realize that the the future of both cities, both sides of the river are intertwined and, and for us to work together. And in fact, we see this more regionally, not just cities uh, along the river, but even out to Placer County, Elk Grove, Woodland, Davis. Uh, our region works better when we put aside the jurisdictional labels and fights and really figure out how do we work together. As Chris said, most people that live in our region don't think of those jurisdictional labels as much as our elected leaders do. So as elected leaders... Isn't that this, interesting? Well, there's one time where we really should follow the lead of our constituents. Oh, that's that. a novel thought, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and, and I think we'll know it's successful when we see that not only people are using it, but that more housing, more commercial development is building up around where these uh, nodes of transit are. Then we'll know that people are taking advantage. I want to go back to Mayor Cabaldon's comment referencing the arena because it really ties in with what you just said about taking an expanded, more enlightened approach. The, the arena, while it is in the city of Sacramento, um, the possibilities for what that type of investment could bring really do have a, an effect that spreads beyond the confines of Sacramento's boundaries. And, and Mayor Cabaldon, I, what I'd like to know is how is it that, that you see uh, the, the cities working together to try and maximize that investment opportunity so that um, the benefits really are shared by all? Well, I, I, the, the first thing that we have been doing together is just to try to make sure that the, that the bad things don't happen, right? So but we want to avoid any, you know, uh, traffic congestion, choke points, um, and the streetcar is a, you know, key element in that sort of strategy. And so part of it is just simply make sure the project works, right? That's the, that's the most important thing right. is it gets delivered, that it happens, um, uh, because it is on the natural, uh, you know, a major project for the entire region. Obviously, a big deal for us because we're right across the river. I think, you know, I, I, I probably will live closer to the new arena than, <laughs> than Mr. Cohn does. Um, we, we'll have to check. Because I'm, right, I'm, right, I'm almost right at the river. But it, uh, so a lot of that is going to be natural spillover, but we just want to make it successful in that way and then connect people mm -hmm. to it, both to, to get to the arena directly, but also to enjoy to, to, as the arena for the anchor of everything else that's happening in the, in the region. Yeah. So a lot of folks, I think, are going to be attracted to say, I, I want to go to games or I want to go to concerts or I just want to be around the energy of that and I want a new place to live. And that place doesn't, it might be right around the arena. It might be, you know, a few blocks away in West Sac, it might be Township 9. It could be anywhere in the urban core, but connected. And that helps to, you can open a restaurant and you don't, your restaurant doesn't have to be in the arena. Right. Mm -hmm. But it might be blocks away, it might be a half a mile away. But if you can get to that on the streetcar, suddenly a whole new market has opened up. And that market is without respect to whether you're in, uh, you know, within five blocks of the arena or you happen to be in a different city or, mm -hmm. or across the American River even. So I think that the arena has, big impacts, especially with the transit yeah. connectivity, to really uh, to drive a lot of economic activity and, across and sectors. Look at the difference, for example, in San Francisco between the connectedness of AT&T Park versus Candlestick. Right. Now, of course, AT&T is also a much nicer park in terms of other, other conveniences, but really the primary thing is its location and being so well connected you can walk you can take all forms of transit to get there make it much more integrated into the the grid in san francisco than candlestick which there's really no other way to get to them by rubberized <laughs> vehicles um, so uh, that's what we're looking for, that synergy. And the other thing, streetcar will actually help get people, even who don't take transit initially, maybe they drove to work, they're in, they parked in a garage, uh, but they're a mile away or, or more from the arena. It'll enable them to use transit, take their time getting back, and then they can drive back when it's no longer rush hour. Let me put a number on it because we, you know, we, had, we before we started, you know, serious work on this, we said, well, you know, we don't want to just get romantic about this. It's not just about going back to the future. Right. Back to the future. Because if it was that, we would pull them with mules like <laughs> the 1950s. That so would be not, interesting. It isn't just about that. It has to actually pencil out. And so we commit. We said, let's commission an independent economic analysis and see what this really, how this really uh, pans out. 
And it came back and said, you know, over $5 billion worth of economic benefit. Really? Yeah, that's not money for the government. I mean, that, that was a few million dollars in taxes, but it was over $5 billion in economic impact. In ripple effect. It, yeah, and not one of these studies with, you know, like 18, you know, 18 times 18 multipliers and whatever that, you know, kind of stretched the uh, credibility, but a real, you know, a real deep analysis of the impact of the streetcar in the context of the arena. It was over $5 billion um, in both, on both sides of the river, uh, you know, throughout, and throughout the region. Um, and so we already, we know very clearly that this, in addition to being great for transit and for walkability and for creating great places, it's a strong economic play for the region, too. How, how do... Um we as a region, your governments and others collaborating together, really maximize this opportunity. Let's assume that we can get the streetcar done. Mm -hmm. What's next? Well, I, I think there's two things. First of all, we, we have to get it done, so we do need the region to help, and we've started In your that. hands, I assume that this is already a <laughs> well, done Well, we'll need their continued cooperation, because so far we have the money to, to do the pre-development phase, but not construction yet. But once it's done, I think what you have to look at is, again, how does it connect into a larger network and also into land use decisions to maximize the investment that's made. So, for example, the River District obviously needs to tie in. Uh, Arden area, Sac State, um, Roseville, uh, Elk Grove, if we can tie them in better, uh, uh, into that grid. So think of it the same way you have a street grid that has, you don't just get off the freeway and you're stuck, you can't get anywhere. You have to have a network of streets to get where you're going. It's the same way with transit. So it, it'll never displace the other system, but it needs to work well for both to work. And I want to talk about West Sac for a minute. In, in terms of since the arena uh, has moved closer to reality, and I realize that there's still a couple of process steps that, that have to be undergone. Are you seeing any greater interest in West Sacramento, and, I, and I'd ask you to think about this as well, Councilman Cohn, from outside investors or people taking a new interest and a new look at, in West Sacramento? A little bit of new interest, for sure. Mm -hmm. But even more, I think, to the point is folks who were already interested, had already, you know, maybe tied up some land, were had a project they were about to start, but now have the like the real confidence that they're going to do it and pull the trigger and the banks that they need to, to finance. So because we are because we'd been making so many infrastructure investments and the impact of Rayleigh Field had already started to open the door. But I think the, the arena project was, a, you know, the strongest possible signal that, no, no, okay, this is for re the whole revitalization of the river and the urban core generally is for real. Um, and both the public and private sector are in it uh, seriously. And so the, it's, it's really, I think, accelerated and intensified the interest in what was already starting to occur, especially in the waterfront districts in West Sac. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, even more so uh, right now downtown, especially we already saw uh, several sales. One recently uh, was a historic building next to the jail that a uh, company wants to come in and uh, put housing in. And we're seeing lots of activity. I think once it actually starts construction, because now there's a little uncertainty given a proposed ballot measure, you'll, uh, once it starts construction, you'll see that really multiply. The second thing that's maybe even more important is aside from the development of the arena, the downtown plaza, all the ancillary development, is having the cream of the crop in terms of uh, high tech, people like Vivek Ranadive, the Jacobs brothers of Qualcomm, they're here in Sacramento several times a week now. They're starting to view our city totally differently in a way that they may want to invest not just real estate, but also bring in tech jobs and other types. Of Interesting jobs. you should say, say that. We had Raj and Alex Patel on the show recently, and um, one of the things that uh, Raj was saying was that he's on the phone with folks, you know, the owner of Dillard's department store. He's going to bring him here to, to share a game with him, that uh, their, their friends and colleagues who they do business with and have other outside relationships with, mm. they want to know, well, what's going on in the Sacramento? And it was interesting hearing from the outside in, from another perspective, mm -hmm. they think that this region is an absolute un unplucked, you know, fruit or a beautiful jewel that no one has really noticed yet. 
Yeah, I think I think so. The arena itself has gigantic impact, but it's this phenomenon that even that's that's related to, but isn't the arena itself, which is that for folks who are thinking about making an investment or going to the bank or trying to get help with an investment, the fact that you have folks of that caliber and you've got you know the billionaires and folks with a lot of success saying Sacramento is the place, and you have government in the Sacramento region getting it together to deliver and also make investments is such a powerful signal that even if you're not expecting a direct impact from the basketball game or the arena itself, that halo effect, um, I, I think we're finding in both in both places, is, help, is helping to drive a huge amount of not just interest, but actually people pulling the trigger to make stuff happen. Not to mention we went head to head with Seattle. And we won. And, and mm -hmm. we won. And so that could be a harbinger. All right, <laughs> and we're going to leave it right there. A streetcar named Sacramento. Best of luck to you both. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. Five Star Bank community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.